are fully recyclable, and I can't wait to see all the things they invent. In agriculture, sure, we have to go back to organic agriculture, but you know, here on Mallorca recently, a young man said, well, my friends don't want to be farmers because they know how hard farming was for their parents and grandparents, eking out a living on the stony soil here. Well, you know, I immediately think up things like if you had to remove a lot of rocks from a field, I'd contact two high schools, get their football teams to come out and have a contest to see which one can move more rocks in four hours or something, you know, and then make supper for them all, put them on local television. Uh, you know, we have to figure out ways to make life on this uh, planet interesting and fun uh, and relatively easy. It doesn't have to be breaking labor anymore because we do have technology available. As long as it's clean and green, we can have the energy sources. We could, if we could invent photosynthesis on a human scale, we wouldn't need any other energy source. You know, this planet has lived for for four billion years on solar energy uh, by using by plants transforming that solar energy into other kinds of chemical energy, physical energy. So there's so, so many wonderful things that can happen in the world right now that I think, and I say this to young people all the time, this is the most exciting time in the whole world to live. Don't let yourself be gotten down by all the doom and gloom. They want you to keep arguing about whether the planet's getting hotter or not. Forget the arguments. This is not a religious issue. It's a matter of we know perfectly well what we need to do on this planet to live clean, green, and in friendly, cooperative, and friendly, competitive ways. We know how to do it already, and we've got all these creative young people who will think up ever more ways of making it fun. There are people right now raising organic meat, having a ball, like Joel Saladin. Look him up, um, S-A-L-A-D-I-N, T-I-N, I think it is. Um, and there, there's uh, Will Allen, a basketball star in Florida, who's in love with compost and worms and says, you don't even need a garden. I'll throw my compost on your asphalt, and you'll be eating veggies in five weeks. Uh, you know, it it can all be fun and exciting. John McMillan has built systems in deserts in 20 places on this planet, including the worst dust bowls of Africa, combining fish and vegetables in a tightly coupled ecosystem that isn't hard to build, and then will feed people a high level of protein diet without any grains or meats. So, you know, I could talk all day about the things that are possible right now and the things I know will be possible with the millions of young engineers being trained now who don't want to be gardeners but want to be techies. That's fine. You have to follow your own heart. Be an artist. Be a musician. Be whatever. But make a better world. That's fantastic. And that's very refreshing to hear as well. Now, how can we, uh, Elizabeth, how can we learn what are the lessons we can learn from Mother Nature herself and how she operates? Because she is a living organism. Yeah, well, she's uh, gone through this maturation cycle with her kids for, for billions of years. You know, the Earth is like a giant living cell, and within it, small cells form. Originally bacterial cells, which had the planet to themselves for the first half of biological evolution, we had nothing but bacteria. But they covered the globe, and interestingly, they're more like humans than any other species in between because they changed the whole landscape. They changed the shape of the, of the seashores. They changed the composition of the atmosphere. They caused global hunger. They caused global pollution, and they solved them all as they got increasingly cooperative. So isn't it interesting that the tiniest little creatures, who, by the way, ended up with their descendants in our own selves, um, there, there's a, a wonderful thing right there that you can learn. Your body has over 50 trillion cells in it, and every cell, even though it's too small for you to see with your naked eye, has in it the complexity of a large human city. Think fractals, where you look into a tiny little dot and find out it's vastly complex. 
every one of those tiny cells in your body has 30,000 recycling centers in it to keep it healthy and a thousand banks giving out free money 24 seven. You wanna know what you can learn from nature? It doesn't matter what your politics are, it doesn't matter if you are a CEO of a corporation or somebody growing their own organic garden. You've got the same cells and they are the perfect model for a system that's in tune with itself, highly cooperative, extraordinarily complex, way more complex than our human society is. And there it is, the lessons are there. No organ can exploit the other ones just for its benefit. You wouldn't last long, would you? And no organ tries to make the other organs be like it. Uh, this is all about diversity and resilience and creativity. It's all there, and we're walking around in bodies like that. I think that's one of the most amazing things I ever learned as a biologist, and I hope everybody takes it seriously and goes to bed tonight thanking all those 50 trillion cells for keeping you so healthy. Absolutely. So what makes us, I mean, as an as a holistic whole or a being, human being, what makes us different from them, from those individual uh, cells? You know, I mean, how are we different? Because, you know, obviously there's something happens between between those individual yes. cells and then when they come together, we seem to kind of like screw things up to a degree, do we not? So what makes yeah, us different? Yeah, you know, one one of the things humans have been doing in the past few centuries is going very deeply into individuation almost deliberately forgetting that we're part of oneness, that we're part of the whole, that we're part of nature, and pretending that we're all individuals separate from each other. Now, in the course of that, we learned a lot about self-confidence, about self-esteem, uh, about how to get things done, how to be resourceful, but it's time, high time now, for us to weave that new knowledge gained from individuation back into community at the higher level, at the next loop up the spiral, where we can use it in a way that will help us ground cosmic love all the way down to our toes as we go into reunion. Charles Eisenstein wrote a wonderful book that's called The Ascent of Humanity, and it's all about how we have been separating ourselves from nature since the Stone Age in various ways and how this is the age at which we go into reunion to remember our oneness and to remember, put to back together our cooperatives, our community, our global community. So it's not that individuation was a bad thing. It's that it was a necessary step, taking us further and further from oneness in order to learn, and now we have to come back into oneness and contribute what we learned into that greater community again. 